Um, thanks very much for having me. Um, like our last speaker, I feel like a little bit I should be barred at the door, the overage person, but it's very nice of you to allow me to mingle. Um, I was speaking, I haven't done many of these, but I, I did uh, I did go up to speak at the Arabs for Independence meeting a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you know that Dundee United are in the cup final. Uh, <laughs> uh, just thought I'd mention that. And um, this meeting is actually a little bit advanced to that. that we had mic one microphone uh, at that meeting, we had four speakers, and by the time we came along to me, the microphone didn't actually reach. Uh, but we kind of had a really uh, good time. But I want to mention just a little bit about my journey, um, and it's probably not dissimilar to, to many people's, but I was thinking about this yesterday because uh, you will have, many of you in this room will have probably looked at the Sunday Herald over the last couple of weeks, and, and yesterday was quite an interesting article about the Macron report. I don't know if you, if you looked into that story about how uh, the oil report was passed over to the British cabinet in the 70s. There were two people who said Scotland should do something about having an oil reserve fund. One was the late John Smith and the other was Tony Benn. And Tony Benn sadly was someone who uh, died earlier this year. But when I was growing up he was a, he was a very big, very big political hero. And I used to collect his diaries and read his stories and loved it. Eventually, about 20 years ago, I, I managed to interview him one day for, for a Radio 1 program. The days that I actually managed to be on Radio 1. Um, for a Radio 1 program they were making about religion and ethics and uh, I spoke to him. But his great thing was, and his great thing he would say to people is, people did not wake up one morning and decide to give women the vote. They didn't wake up one morning and decide to give everyone the vote. They didn't decide, wake up one morning and decide to enfranchise people. And they certainly didn't suddenly wake up in 1999 and decide, oh, it'd be a lovely thing if Scotland had a parliament. It didn't come from nowhere. It didn't come because people thought it was a good idea. And tonight, somewhere else, Douglas Alexander, who's a good friend of mine, is a nice chap, but he will be telling you why they will be giving you all these things in years to come and why it's uh, something that's to be given. I don't think it is to be given. It's something that we've got to claim and something we've got to fight for and something that is, I think, a democratic right. And it's brilliant to be in a room full of young people who are making an attempt to do that, as Ross said, without any political party, without an official backing. That's very inspiring. So why, why am I here? Why are some other people here? Well, why I'm here is because during these years, our last speaker was talking about these years from 1979 when I first got a vote, the year of 1983, by the time I'd moved to Glasgow. 1987, I was in a band. We were touring around the country. We were telling people in little toilets in England and small venues all over the place, they must go and vote Labour. And of course, no one did. And in 1992, we thought we were going to get a Scottish Parliament because there was going to be a Labour government, and it didn't happen. And every single time we did it, we voted for something completely different here and that we didn't get. And there comes a point where you believe that is a democratic deficit, and it's quite, quite wrong. And at that point, I decided whatever happened, I was going to feel strongly about having a Scottish Parliament. And certainly, by the time that the Scottish Parliament came in, there was a big debate as to whether people who believed in independence should support it. But I believed quite strongly that once we get a grasp of independence, of making decisions for ourselves, who in the right mind would want to hand that back again? No one that I know ever does. No country ever goes back to the mother country and says, you know what, we've tried this and it doesn't work. <laughs> you take over. We don't know what we're doing. And that's why people are so scared about it, because they realize that in September the 18th, once this happens, it won't go back the way. I'm a great admirer of small independent countries, and every now and again, I go to Ireland, and um, you get a taxi from the airport or whatever, and the Irish are great about mourning at their government because they always believe every government they have is completely corrupt. Sometimes they're not wrong. And so the conversation goes back and forward and back and forward. And eventually I always have the same question to the, the Dublin taxi driver. I said, well, here you go. If things are so bad, how about this? Would you like to come back into the British state? <laughs> they always laugh. <laughs> it's never going to happen. It's not 
likely. It won't happen. And that's why I think it's so important. But we were comparing there what happened in 1979 and in years gone by to just now, and it is hugely different. In 1992, on the back of a terribly disappointing election, excuse me, back of a terrible election when people actually thought there was going to be a Scottish Parliament delivered. I was part of a, a growing movement of people who eventually organised a rally in George Square and various other things, but nothing much changed other than a lot of people came together to really campaign hard for a Scottish Parliament. And maybe some of that paid off today, but the real difference is that you could not get people's heads above the parapet. You could not get people talking about independence. Now, I've got four children, I can't stop them talking about it. They want to campaign, they want to be involved in it, they want to talk to their friends about it, even if it's on Facebook, if it's on Twitter, and you are part of that. And I've got to tell you, as a very old person, it's very, very exciting. I think it's a journey to yes, and I really do believe it's a journey we're all making together. If you're, I hope, I'm not assuming you're on that journey, but if, you're, if, if, you're, if you are undecided, I would say this, a lot of people I think are going to position themselves over the next few months to make sure they're on the winning side. And that after September the 18th, you'll find an awful lot of people who said, oh yeah, I was always a yes person. <laughs> I think we'll win. Thank you.